And if they're having a bad day, it's chocolate therapy. It's difficult to make a dessert shop profitable. <laughs> the business side and the vision side have to go hand in hand or the vision dies. So Deseret First helped me when I needed to attain additional financial capital. I actually really do trust that they want me to succeed. My name is LaDonia Jones and my why is I want to be a day changer. I can't remember the last time I've had lobster. Or do I just sort of nibble at it like this? Are you ready for an adventure? I've set aside seven days with no interruptions, just to hang out one-on-one. -on -one. We're gonna have a vacation. A bonding vacation. And we are going to confront some of our fears. I don't like it. Okay, I've had enough. I've had enough. I'm calling the shots, so you better be ready. <laughs> Do you know how scary that is to me? Yep. He's pinching me. He's pinching me. Has anyone ever been thrown out of the boat? Only troublemakers. Why are we doing this, John? This is fun. Oh, oh my. Is it okay if I cry a bit? Oh, oh, oh. That's what I'm talking about! Oh, oh, oh. Monica, step back. He's gonna love this, man. I'm petrified. We usually watch Jeopardy. That's about it. She's about to do this. I'm proud of her. What you need to do is channel excitement, exuberance, and love of adventure. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You're watching BYU TV on KBYU DT Provo Salt Lake City. Well, good Monday morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. Welcome back inside Coordinator's Corner, presented by JCW's The Burger Boys. We are coming to you live from Studio C in the BYU Broadcasting Building. And on this week's show, we talk offense with BYU OC Jeff Grimes and some special teams with Coordinator Ed Lamb. And we're taking your questions for the coaches, too. Just submit them using hashtag CCBYU. And we'll see if yours makes it on the show. BYU comes into the week coming off a season opening setback to Utah, snapping a five game BYU win streak in Little Lifters and extending to nine games. Utah's advantage over BYU. With that, we bring in Coach Jeff Grimes. And uh, we'll coach every 0 1 team today is wishing things would have gone better in their opener. And BYU is one of those teams. Certainly. And um, a lot of things we could have done better as we reviewed the film and talked with our players about it. But the bottom line is you can't give a good team 21 points and expect to be in it. And uh, really, there, there are a lot of other things that we could have done better. But really, if we just don't do that thing, and that thing was, was a big thing. Uh, but really, I feel like that's something we've prided ourselves in um, is, is turnover margin. Uh, last year, we had 16 giveaways that is an offense on the whole season. So for us to start with giving away three in the very first game is very disappointing. Well, almost nothing we can discuss matters as much as the turnover numbers. Uh, and it's almost the case against Utah in this game. Uh, BYU minus three on Thursday. No takeaways for BYU. And of the three turnovers, uh, you know, when two are for scores, and then the third uh, results in a touchdown a couple of plays later, it's kind of ball game, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it really is. And, and certainly we could have done some things on other drives that would have given us a better opportunity for scores, had, had two botched. Uh, snaps in the red zone, uh, low red. One was a two-point conversion. The other was on a critical third and three. But either of those, um, I think, gives us an opportunity for, for more points as well. In the uh, nine straight losses to Utah, BYU has turned it over in every game. Uh, Cougs minus 15 in the margin over the nine games. The most remarkable number, Jeff, I guess, would be the defensive touchdowns Utah scores because they've had nine in the nine games, and that's maybe the biggest reason the streak's maybe gotten to where it is. That's, that's a really unusual number, isn't it? It is, and you know, you gotta give them credit where it's due. As much as I, I don't um, <laughs> enjoy the outcome, um, they they played well, and they, they play an aggressive style of defense, a lot of man coverage, and, and uh, take a little bit more risk than some teams do, and um, we just didn't capitalize on that and make them pay for it. Look back a bit at the game itself. Uh, your opening series sees BYU get to a fourth and four at the Utah 40. Now, BYU's never made a 57-yard field goal in its history, so maybe an easy decision to go for it there. Plus, it's aggressive. Um, Zach throws it to uh, a guy out of bounds a little bit. Looks like he gave him maybe some other options on that play, too. 
Yeah, he had a couple of other options, um, but felt like he had a match up there that he liked, and that's okay, but when you go there, you need to complete it. And so we just, we had too many of those in this game as well, where we were um, covered and, and just couldn't throw and catch um, in some critical situations. And he, Eddie, uh, that was going to be a go for it, wasn't it? Just length and everything else, you're going to go. Yeah, yeah. In general, that's our philosophy. Yeah. It's mine and it's, it's Kalani's. When we have an opportunity on on the plus side of the field and it's a it's a fourth and medium or fourth and small, we're going to go for that and see if we can get a touchdown out of it. So Utah took over there, scored first in the uh, Kalani Sitake era. First scores have meant a lot. Uh, BYU's got a 36% win rate when they give up the first score and almost double that when they get out in front. But uh, two, dri two drives later, you're in the red zone, and uh, you get there courtesy of a really nice run from uh, Tyson Williams. James MP pulled and led him on an 18-yard scamper, and uh, you were in business. Yeah, I thought Ty, for his first game with us, had a, had a good first game. I just I wish we could have given him a few more opportunities. My game plan really was to, was to um, throw the football and run it wide in the first half, and we had some success with that. And in the second half, we were going to run it more, in particular run it between the tackles more once we had him loosened up a little bit and just didn't get as many opportunities as, as uh, we wanted to, mainly because we gave them the ball. In that first red zone possession, you end up kicking a field goal to tie it. Um, you're in the game at that point. It's 3-3 and you're off and running, I guess. Yeah, as always, you'd like to score a touchdown there, and we, we've, we've uh, been pretty good at that. Um, but, our, but our touchdown conversion rate obviously wasn't good in this game in the red zone. On the ensuing series, it was kind of a big swing. Uh, Utah made that kickoff return uh, mistake, uh, end up punting from their own goal line. BYU is in great field position. Then comes that first pick six. Uh, Zach was maybe a half second away from getting Tyson for a big game. Yeah, there was, there was a little bit of pressure on Zach that particular throw and um, probably should have just eaten the ball and taken a sack. Uh, but that's kind of what makes him special is his ability to create and make plays. And so sometimes you... You live with a little bit of that. However, he's just got to be more careful and take care of the ball. And, and, and again, it's not, all, it's not all his fault. And typically, um, things like that involve more than one thing. And, and uh, the protection was mostly good for the night. Um, but on that particular play, it wasn't from either edge. I'm sure you've gone back and looked at that one play. His knee was close to being down as he was trying to get rid of it. Might have been close enough for them to look at, but I think the more I see it kind of live and slowed down, it feels like the ball's away a split second before he's actually down on the ground. Yeah, I thought so. Like, I yeah. thought so, too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, your next series was a good one, um, and then you got inside the 20. Uh, Zach threw a tough ball for Dax Milne, close on that sideline in the end zone. Tyson gets you seven, then it's third and three, and you only had a couple of really bad shotgun snaps on the night. I say bad. Um, Jaron Hall was a quarterback for that one. It was just high and, and not where you expected the ball to be, I guess, right? Yeah, the ball was high and left twice. And when you're a, when you're a gun team, it's no different than being under center. The, quarterback, the quarterback's expecting the ball to be in a certain spot. And, uh, yeah, we only had a couple, but the, the two in, in this case <laughs> were two that could have resulted in points, one yeah. for the two-point conversion. And then this one, a third and three, I thought we had a really good play called that would have at least resulted in the first down and given us a chance to go in and, and go for a touchdown after that. Um, but, yeah, cost, costly mistake. Used Jaron on a reverse that, that, that uh, was, was played in the game, and then, of course, you had him there. We're going to see him at different times of every game, wouldn't you think? Yeah, and I think the more he plays, the more comfortable he'll get. This was really his, his first real opportunity um, with, a lot of, with a lot of plays in the game plan with his name on it. And, you know, he played a little receiver and um, a little quarterback and um, some running back as well. And w we, can, we can use him in a number of different ways, and I think we will more and more as the season progresses. BYU was down 9-6 at halftime, and then it was a 21 straight Utah points in the second half, including a second pick six. And uh, we talked off the air a little bit earlier, uh, 18 plays in a half is not a lot, and that's what you're limited to after halftime on, on Thursday. Yeah, like I said, we had we had some ideas about what we were going to do in the second half, and I really feel like um, like that was a good plan, uh, but just didn't get many opportunities. Again, mainly just because we gave them the ball on two of our three drives, and and just didn't get just didn't get chances to sustain. When you look back on the game, and we'll look ahead here uh, coming up shortly too, um, what maybe uh, surprised you most about the way things transpired Thursday that you didn't see coming when you came into the game? 
Um, I didn't see us turning the football over like that again, given what we, a, a couple of the things that we did really well last year. One was, one was control the turnover margin. Um, another was score touchdowns in the red zone. And we didn't do, we didn't do well on either of those counts. And so I think, uh, the, again, those two things were the differences in the game. Um, I expected them to be good. I expected them to, uh, to challenge us. I thought our, um, um, I thought our protection um, was good for the most part, maybe a little bit better than, than anticipated. Um, at times they covered us a little bit better than I anticipated as well. You're not going to see necessarily that same Utah team this week or any other week. It's, it's a different look that they give you and a, and a pretty aggressive one. Yeah, it certainly is. And again, I, I, I give them credit because they played well and they earned the right to win. Well, BYU falls to uh, Utah 30-12, to and now the Cougs uh, play next in Knoxville. We'll talk more about uh, Tennessee a little later on in the show. And on uh, tomorrow's edition of BYU Football with Kalani Sitake, that's Tuesdays at 8.30 Eastern, 5.30 Pacific on the BYU TV app, and Wednesdays at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific on BYU TV. Coming up after the break, Coach Grimes gives us his Offensive Player of the Week, and we talk about a good third down performance that uh, did not equate to a good win, but you are in the Coordinator's Corner, brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. Her mother says, you can't marry him. You haven't known him long enough. Now look at it, almost seven years. <laughs> we have 33 grandchildren. The Lord's blessed us in many ways. I can't believe that it's been almost 70 years ago that I married him. And he makes every day of my life a happy one. We're the Gandys. And our wife is our family tree. Everyone loves a good magic trick. You like magic, don't you? See, a good magic trick has the power to both confuse and delight. It brings us back to when we were younger and we saw the world through a fresh pair of eyes. Anything seemed possible back then. See, that's why it works. People love magic because deep down, we all want to be tricked. Mission? Get into Old School Cafe. Okay. We'll give you a call. Meet the founder, okay. Teresa Goins. <laughs> Work alongside the staff and see how a restaurant runs. You're welcome. See why they do it and see figure out how I can help. I don't know which one those are. And five, hope they don't realize that I'm not the best cook. All right, those even sound like me. <laughs> <laughs> Zach shotgun, handoff, Tyson Williams. Tyson nice sidestep, pass. runs into a blocker at the five, keeps the legs nice turning pass. all the way to the end zone. What a run by Tyson Williams. Pounced off one of his own guys and kept the legs driving into the end zone for the Cougars' first touchdown of the night. And it was Tyson's first touchdown as a Cougar, too. Welcome back to the Coordinator's Corner, where each week at BYU's offensive, defensive, and special teams coordinators help us recognize a player whose effort and performance merit consideration as a player of the week. And as we visit with offensive coordinator Jeff Grimes, we shine the light this week, Jeff, on a starting left tackle, Brady Christensen. Yeah, I was, I was uh, proud of how Brady played against a really good opponent. Bradley and I is a great pass rusher, a good all-around defensive end, and I thought, for the most part, um, Brady handled him well. Um, Brady has really improved this offseason. He's gotten bigger, stronger. You know, last year he was just a freshman, kind of hanging on at times. Um, and just playing with a lot of poise and confidence right now. And, and uh, his, his play on Thursday night was representative of the camp that he's had. He's been one of our most consistently improved players this fall. How many reserve linemen did you uh, rotate in on, on Thursday? Two other linemen, which was our plan, kind of so we, we thought, played right? a total of yeah. seven, yeah. yeah. Seven for five, at least at the very start of the season, was what you felt comfortable with, right? That's right. Does it, do you expect it getting, uh, well, you want a consistent group, obviously, first. Anybody close to breaking into where they're, you know, rep-worthy? No, I'd say right now we're at seven for, for the time being. 
And you've spoken historically about what your lines have looked like in the past. Is this pretty much where you're at or where you've been? With uh... um, I think this is a good start. I, I was interested to see how they would perform against a good defense in, in a first game, and, and I thought overall they played pretty well. Certainly some things we can, we can improve in there as well as all positions. But I thought um, it, it showed um, a group that was capable of, of being um, much improved over last year and one of the strengths of our team. Brady in the O-line allowing only one sack uh, to a very good Utah defense. And they were blocking for a back in Tyson Williams making his first start in a BYU uniform. Led the Cougs in rushing. Uh, led all running backs actually from both teams in yards per carry. Uh, 45 yards on seven totes. That's a 6.4 clip for Tyson. Yeah, he... He played like I, like I thought he would and like he's capable of playing and certainly excited to see what he, what he brings the rest of the way. Was the seven carry number uh, lower because of game plan or game script the way it unfolded? Yeah, we, we were planning to give him a lot more carries in the second half and as I mentioned earlier, just didn't get the opportunities. But you can see what you've got and it's pretty encouraging, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Uh, Lopini Katoa, his role uh, this year, do you see it kind of being complimentary to Tyson? Yeah, and you know, sometimes you have a guy that may not be the starter, but he end up he may end up being the hot hand that particular day, so it doesn't mean that he might not be our leading rusher in a particular game, but Pini does a lot of things really well. He's a really good receiver. He's an excellent um, blocker. He's, he's great at running um, our tight plays between the tackles, and so he, he will have a very important role this season, regardless of what Ty does. And you like your other backs there as well in, uh, in Soup and, and Finau and Algier as well. Yeah, Soup was a little bit banged up going into the game, and so we, we had him ready um, kind of in an emergency capacity, but ended up not really getting to him. And Algier's getting special team snap as the off turner as well right now. Yeah. Uh, well, Tyson paced BYU in rushing yards. Zach Wilson led BYU in actual carries. You include his scrambles, and he ran eight times for 43. And he also had your longest run uh, of 26 yards, showing you what kind of a playmaker he can be. Yeah, and I, I think the next step is for us to continue to grow as, as an entire team that under, understands how to play when Zach scrambles. Um, he's got the kind of ability to make people miss and get outside the pocket. And um, on that long run, you saw Peeney get a block for him. You saw Talon Shumway get a great block for him way down near the goal line. Um, but we got to get the rest of our team scrambling to get in position for a throw or a block as well. In Zach's uh, first game back after the surgery rehab, took some hard hits uh, too on that night and got up every time. Yeah, I think he was. It was good. It's good to see that and and know that he's just fine. It wasn't his best night statistically, but it was his first night as a season opening starter. When you look at that, this was really uh, the first time he's ever had that kind of opening night pressure. How do you assess his overall performance? Well, anytime you're the quarterback and you throw two pick sixes, it can't be a good night. And those two things override anything else that he might have done. I mean, his completion percentage wasn't bad. He threw some nice balls. He scrambled well, and, and all of that was good. But if you give the other team um, turnovers, um, and then we had another one on a, on a center, uh, excuse me, on a, on a quarterback running back exchange, um, that overrules anything else. I'm sure Zach would say the same thing. Yeah, what did you see on the fumble uh, in terms of, it wasn't just a clean, it wasn't a clean, it was supposed to be a handoff, not a pull, right? It was one that could have gone either way, but it was intended to be a handoff in that particular case and just um, a little bit loose and a little bit sloppy on the exchange. Uh, as a team, uh, there were some areas in which BYU performed uh, more than adequately, and that includes third downs. Uh, you talked a lot about it uh, in, in the preseason. You wanted that to be an area of emphasis, and, and BYU was 6 of 12 on thirds. Ironically, a third and short was maybe as tough as third and long on that night. Uh, one for three on third and three or shorter. Those are the yards you really expect to get to keep the sticks moving. Yeah, overall, overall a, a good third down um, performance for us. And I, and I do believe, even though it didn't pay off in this game, in the long run, the time and the emphasis that we placed on it will result in, in more wins and success for us down the road. Um, and we know that they're a very aggressive defense on third and short, and so we um, intended to be aggressive as well and went for some bigger plays and just didn't always come away with it. And, of course, one of the third and threes really don't get a shot because of the snap, and that gets fumbled, and it just becomes a dead play at that point. Yeah. Then we had another one where we, where we had, um, had an aggressive pass play called, and then we had a false start on it and felt like we had the look that we wanted. So, again, just um, shot ourselves in the foot. 
Another issue you wanted to address in uh, 2019 was explosiveness. And on the night, uh, BYU had uh, five runs of 10 yards or longer and four passes of uh, 15 yards or longer. So there were some chunk plays uh, that you want to see. Yeah. And so, again, I think the emphasis that we've paid on those two areas um, showed up. Um, and in the long run, it'll make a difference for us. And uh, Utah's longest play uh, was a 28-yard play. You see BYU's at 26. So neither team was letting big, big plays beat them. But you have to <laughs> then you come back to say, well, pick sixes are big plays, and they were they were long runs in for for scores. And that's yeah, kind there, of uh, there's there's no bigger swing than a pick six. Well, as we uh, head to break, a reminder that uh, dinner after the game at JCW's includes something for everybody, from burgers to wings, shakes to salads, JCW's quality, and a lot of it in Lehigh, American Fork, Provo, South Jordan, and coming soon to Harriman. Get ready for Saturday's game at Tennessee with Cougar pregame live starting at 3 p.m. Mountain on BYU Radio. Coming up next, special teams coordinator uh, and linebackers coach Ed Lamb will join us. That's after the bottom of the hour. More with Jeff Grimes coming up next right here on BYU TV. So I hear you've got a new show. I'm on a new show called Making Good. I go around the country and I find people that are making a difference in their community. Mm. It's the best thing I've ever been a part of. You can tell you're having a lot of fun. It is so much fun. Um, what's Hey, wake up, the boom's in the shot. Hello? Let me check. Is there a Kirby here? for season premieres this September on BYU TV. I would if it was me. I'm super excited. Well, let's go, go, go! First, venture back to Victorian-era London, where Hetty Feather faces a whole new season of choices and challenges. Then, don't get stuck in the dark ages. Fast forward to Dwight in shining armor, Princess Greta's unsuspecting champion. Also, if you think Relative Race is a competition show, think again. Finding family is the ultimate reward. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, gather around for the Sunday night movie. Here we go. All audiences approve. See all the season premieres September on BYU TV. You are in the coordinator's corner, brought to you by JCW's, the Burger Boys. This Saturday, BYU plays a first-ever game against Tennessee. And lost the Cougars' first foray into Neyland Stadium. Uh, not the first time on the checkerboard for offensive coordinator Jeff Grimes. Big venue, lots of history, Jeff. And uh, this past weekend, uh, a lot of unhappy fans. They were upset by Georgia State. <laughs> Well, that can happen to uh, any team on the first game of the season for sure. But they're, they're a quality team with a lot of good players and, and, a, and a lot of good coaches. I know a number of those guys and know what they're capable of. And so it, it'll be a great challenge for us. And, you know, the thing that's interesting in college football is from week to week, you never know what you're going to get. And so um, I'm, sure, I'm sure that we'll see a different team than, than what we saw um, against Georgia State this past Saturday, um, but but it's a quality team. It's a great place to play a game. It's a lot of fun, a big venue, and so I, I, I'm really looking forward to the opportunity for our players to go and show what they got there. This time of year, heat and humidity uh, are, are present down there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure, and uh, hopefully we'll be ready for it. So uh, when you've got a Thursday night game and you have a Saturday where you're not playing and your opponent is, uh, on a Saturday afternoon. Are you the kind of guy that's going to settle in at home and try and watch it? Are you at the office pounding away and you're going to get a glance here or there? I spent plenty of time watching film this weekend. I'll just say that. <laughs> did you see the game live? I no? did not watch it live. I watched parts of it, but I was watching cut-ups of their regular season play, um, kind of getting a jump on what I would normally do. 
on a, on a Monday on, on this particular weekend. Um, but I watched it, obviously, the full game. So now that you've seen uh, what you saw, impressions of Tennessee's opener? Well, I think just like us, a team that, that you look back at it and say that I'm sure their coaches are saying the same thing that we are, didn't play to uh, the level of, of our capability and disappointed and frustrated by that. I'm, I'm sure they feel the same way, but they're a very capable team. Like I said, they've got a lot of players there who, who a lot of other schools coveted and, um, and a good coach. Um, so it, it'll be a good challenge. It's pretty intriguing because you've got two teams both – I mean, it's a rebound week for both. Both, neither one's happy, and both are looking to avoid going 0-2. And it's been a long time. Neither team opens 0-2 historically. Uh, last happened for BYU back in 95, and for Tennessee it was 1988. So 0-2 is not a regular thing for either program. There's a lot, I get a lot riding on week two already. Yeah, you know, in college football nowadays, there's a lot riding on every Saturday. <laughs> you know, I mean, every, every game is big, and every game is another opportunity to prove yourself. And so, honestly, as, as coaches and hopefully as a team, we try to remove ourselves from all that other stuff and just focus on the task at hand, and that's getting ready for Tennessee's defense. Okay, Tennessee's defense did give up 38 points, including a two short field touchdowns after turnovers. Uh, what do you see from the Tennessee D uh, being coached by a first-year coordinator in uh, Derek Ansley? Yeah, a defense that does a lot, very multiple, particularly in the back end, a lot of, a lot of different types of coverages, uh, trying to disguise and confuse quarterbacks. Um, a number of things that are that are just a little bit different than what they did last year. But, you know, Jeremy Pruitt's the head coach, and he's a guy that, you know, spent, spent his early years with Nick Saban and learned defense from, from the best. And, and it's a similar system, one that um, attempts to get themselves in the right coverage versus the right formation, the right personnel group. And so it, they'll do a lot, and there's a lot there schematically that will provide a challenge for us. What's been your personal history at Neyland Stadium with coach, with teams you've gone in with? Um, so went there once with Auburn and we won and went there once with LSU and won. So it's it, you're hoping to keep the thing rolling here and, and make it 3-0. Absolutely. Yeah. But as I alluded to earlier, <laughs> none of that matters. So it, it'll be this Saturday, our guys against their guys. Did you, uh, you're, you're, you're far enough roof, uh, removed from Auburn. Any connection still to the program there? With Auburn? Yeah. Um, yeah, certainly. I, mean, I was there with Gus for three years, um, as well as several of the other coaches. Um, Kevin Steele, the defensive coordinator, is a good friend of mine, and he um, he was um, at LSU as the defensive coordinator when I was there for a year. Um, the offensive line coach, J.B. Grimes, was a guy that I actually was a grad assistant for a number of years ago. Um, no relation? No. No relation? No. Uh, Cody Burns is on the staff. He was one of our players on the national championship team. Um, yeah, there are several guys on that staff that, that I know fairly well. Uh, quick tangent, their Oregon result on the weekend, did you catch one of that or watch that at all? Or I, did, I did, I yeah. did. I did watch that, and, um, wow, they made some plays in the fourth quarter and, and found a way to get the win. There was a funny photo posted um, of Cam Newton celebrating with, like, a little kid named Bo Nix back on the national championship year uh, for yeah. the postgame, and there he is, the quarterback. Uh, yeah, I know yeah. Bo, and I know his dad, Patrick, who's a high school coach. And, uh, and I know their family fairly well and, and really happy for them. Great people. A social media question now for Coach uh, Jeff Grimes. And it alludes to, or it goes to what we've already talked about a little bit from, uh, at Donald, uh, from Donald Lee. How do you prepare to play a team that's angry and embarrassed like Tennessee was on Saturday? Um, you know, the only thing that I've tried to do already with our players is help them realize that you don't always see the same team a following Saturday from what you saw on film the previous week. And so um, just because Georgia State was able to do certain things doesn't necessarily mean that that will just happen um, so easily this coming week. And so I think the challenge is really more for our players to, to show up and play a team that we know will be motivated. What did you kind of uh, get from your players when you guys met together as groups here to, to put what happened last week behind you and, and move ahead? Um, Disappointment, frustration, and, you know, we, I gave them an opportunity to talk a little bit about our identity as an offense. And one of the things that, that we really try to emphasize as a team and, and in our culture is something that Kalani preaches, and that is that execution is strategy. And our, and our execution has to be our strategy. That's got to be how we win. And we certainly didn't do that on Saturday. And so one of the things that we talked about um, was how we make that 
uh, a part of who we are on a daily basis. And if we're going to expect to not have uh, false starts, which we had one on a critical third and one the other night, um, we, if we're not going to have those, then we can't have them in practice. Uh, and you've practiced already, have you practiced since? Yeah, one or two times already, or one time? Did you practice yeah. Saturday? No, we'll practice today. Practice today will be your first time back. Yeah. And, um, and we're meeting so many days after the Utah game that in a lot of ways you've already moved on, right? It's, it's a Tennessee week, and, and what happened happened. Other than this conversation right yeah. here. <laughs> they figured this would be it, yeah. We're, we're already moved on to, to uh, Knoxville, yeah. All right, well, good luck this weekend in Knoxville, and we'll, uh, we'll talk to you back here sometime soon. All right, thanks, All right. Greg. Thanks a lot. All right, uh, BYU TV gets you ready for the Cougars and Tennessee on Countdown to Kickoff Saturday, 6 Eastern, 3 Pacific, the game on ESPN and BYU Radio, with uh, BYU TV returning for postgame coverage afterwards. Coming up next, special teams coordinator and linebackers coach Ed Lamb joining us in the coordinator's corner live from Studio C right here on BYU TV. I can't remember the last time I've had lobster. Do I just sort of nibble at it like this? Are you ready for an adventure? I've set aside seven days with no interruptions just to hang out one on one. We're going to have a vacation. <laughs> A bonding vacation. And we are going to confront some of our fears. I don't like it. OK, I've had enough. I've had enough. I'm calling the shots, so you better be ready. <laughs> Do you know how scary that is to me? Yep. He's pinching me. He's pinching me. Uh, has anyone ever been thrown out of the boat? Only troublemakers. Why are we doing this, John? This is fun. Oh, oh my. Is it OK if I cry a bit? Oh, 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 oh. That's what I'm talking about. Oh. Step back. He's gonna love this, man. I'm petrified. We usually watch Jeopardy. That's about it. She's about to do this. I'm proud of her. What you need to do is channel excitement, exuberance, and love of adventure. Whoa, 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 whoa. Are you sure you want to do it? No. Jump! 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 Ready to rise and shout? Because a new season of shows are out. For starters, the Family Cooking Showdown is back with an all-new season of Dinner Takes All. Then, discover which generation really is the best in season two of Battle of the Ages. And you're up for new episodes of BYU Sports Nation, Countdown to Kickoff, and the BYU TV Sports post-game show. Summer may be winding down, but the competition is heating up all September on BYU TV. It's a good snap by Harris. The hold is good. The kick by Jake is on its way. And it is three for three. You are in the coordinator's corner, brought to you by JCW's, the Burger Boys. And to kick off the second half hour of our show, we welcome in BYU's special teams coordinator, linebackers coach, and assistant head coach, Ed Lamb. And uh, Coach Lamb, eight months of uh, Utah talk is now behind us. Now, Bill Belichick would say we're on to Tennessee. Um, but we're going to take just some time to look back a little bit at what happened uh, last Thursday. Uh, and the easy talking point is going to be turnovers. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. We didn't get any on defense. Is, is really, that's my primary area of responsibility. And we actually, we call them takeaways. I, I mentioned that I was talking with Coach Grimes after the game. And, you know, he's kind of lamenting the, the turnovers. I said, you know, defensively, we call those takeaways. We feel like the defense has something to do with that. And, and we didn't get any. And so I thought that was the turning point in the game. So on that note, uh, Utah's won nine straight over BYU and in almost half the games, four of the nine, uh, Utah's been turnover free or BYU's been takeaway free, if you will, but they played cleanly. You've got to give them credit. Absolutely. Yeah, we give, we give them credit coming into the game and, uh, and still uh, the, the major disappointment is I feel like we have the players to win that game. And so um, it, we feel like that uh, uh, yet another one gets away from us and there's a lot of disappointment in that. It'd be nice to see how BYU does in a turnover-free game against Utah, but in all nine losses, it's at least one turnovers and multiples in seven of the nine, so it's, it's hard. Yeah, and, and I thought that was something that we uh, obviously we could address with our takeaways, and then, and then late in the game, I felt like defensively we were demoralized um, and, and didn't play with a lot of pride there down the stretch, and that's another area where we, we have to do a better job as coaches, uh, preparing our players for those moments, and then, and then the players need to respond, and Again, it, it's around in circles. We need to find a way to make them respond. It's, it's on us. 
I want to go back to BYU's first series of the game because it features a fourth down play that uh, ends up being a turnover on downs, not a true turnover. It's fourth and four from the 40. Obviously, the presumption is you go for it. Uh, set a tone, move the chains, and it's a long, long field goal. Was there even a hint of consideration at trying Jake's leg from there? Uh, no, not not from that spot, um, but uh, there was definitely the consideration was between uh, what we call a pooch punt or a placement punt to try to pin the opponent deep, as you said, or or go for it on offense. And I just, uh, you know, I thought that uh, Coach Shatake just at, at that moment felt like that was the right decision for that moment. And that early in the game, that, that probably is uh, the best time to, to do something, an aggressive move like that. Yeah. It didn't, didn't work out, and so it turned out to be the wrong decision. But as coaches, we understand that sometimes the, the a, a decision becomes the wrong decision when it doesn't work. But by the numbers, it's a, a, that, that's a logical call, though, in a lot of ways. And it's also a tone setter at your first series, and, and, and four yards isn't 14 yards. It just didn't work out. Yeah. Um, so uh, Utah pick six accounts for the only touchdown of the first half. Uh, Utah opened the game with a field goal. Oldroyd makes two first-half field goals for BYU, so it's a 9-6 game at halftime. And, and I guess the problem was just the fact you were settling for Jake instead of, uh, instead of you know, Jake being more of a weapon from longer distance. Um, Cougs had first down snaps inside the red zone and just to, couldn't punch it in. That's right. Yeah, you said it well. We, we'd, we'd like to get to the point where, um, you know, where, where our offense is uh, finishing drives, executing drives into the end zone, and Jake's kicking uh, PATs, and then, and then to really stretch that scoring area uh, when necessary, that's that's where a field goal kicker like Jake can really uh, be a weapon. But but you know, as it is, he, he we hung in there for a while because he did execute the ones that he that we should like to execute at right. a high percentage. He was two for two, as was the case at Utah last November. Things get away from BYU in the second half. Uh, really, in both Utah games, November and now, pretty good first halves. You're either leading or right there. Mm -hmm. In the second half, uh, things get away. Utah scores 21 straight, but of their three touchdown drives, that only one was a full field effort. Um, another was a pick six, the other was a short field after a fumble. So they were taking away and putting things away pretty cleanly at that point. Yeah, yeah I think that, and that's a good um, a challenge for our defense. I don't, I don't think that uh, defensively the guys are demoralized about who they are, but I thought, they, I thought we were demoralized about how we, how we were playing, and that's really what we have to address. I think, I think the guys have confidence moving forward that they can be a strong defensive unit, and uh, really the, the disappointment was that we, we couldn't uh, get to the point where we were winning a one drive, a one score game. You know, if, if, it be, if it can become that on defense where there's just kind of one meaningful drive by the opponent in the first three quarters, you know, we needed to stop them on that one time as well in order to be an elite defense. And we didn't, we didn't step up to that challenge and didn't get that done in the game. You like to, uh, takeaways, you love defensive scores, and that's something Utah's been able to do against BYU consistently in these uh, nine straight wins, nine defensive touchdowns for the Utes. Yeah, any, anytime we've ever gotten those on defense, we feel like we've, we've got a lot to do with it, forcing turnovers, putting pressure on the quarterback. Um, yeah, I, if, you and I have talked about this before. The statistics show when, when, uh, when teams are behind, they press a little bit more, and, and we, we allowed our, ourselves to get behind there, and so we start to press a little bit more on offense. And if the defense is solid and, and creates pressure in those situations, that's when turnovers are more likely to occur. So there's going to be a cumulative effect maybe um, when so many consecutive losses happen to one program. Next time we play Utah, it'll, it'll come up, it'll get discussed. But the immediate residual impacts, what you, what you have to worry about right now, is making sure, and you're a few days out already, but that's gone and Tennessee is full focus. It, 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 yeah, there, I mean, on a personal level, um, losses, uh, whether it's, it's to Utah or our consecutive losing streak or... Or you can you can ask me about a season ten or fifteen years ago. Losses stick with with coaches and and with players too. But I think uh, as as coaches, we so often feel like we have the players to win, and it's heartbreaking when we don't lead the guys to victory. And that's that's certainly that won't be leaving me anytime soon. But professionally, you know, I, I learned from working on uh, uh, my father's construction crews when I was really young. Like no matter how hard the previous day is. You get up early the next morning and, and you go. And, and in his case, you know, being the leader out there, it was, um, you know, for him, it was about setting the tone. And so professionally, um, it's all optimism moving forward, and it's all about the task at hand, and, and that is not Utah for uh, until next September. It was a weird night in a lot of ways when you throw in a weather delay on top of it all and then not getting the ball back in the final 10 minutes of the game after the delay. I walked out of the stadium that night with somebody from Utah who said, it was oddly anticlimactic, the night. And it really what kind of was, because Utah, normally BYU-Utah games go right down to the end. This one wasn't that way, plus the delay. It just didn't, it felt very different. 
It did. Yeah, we, we just, uh, that thing got too far away from us and uh, we were not able to bring uh, the boys out with, um, with enough focus, determination, belief really to turn the game with eight minutes uh, or so left and, and out there on defense. Okay, on to the next game and time for a break. When we come back, Coach Lamb with his special teams player of the week and still to come, a look ahead to this weekend's trip to Tennessee. This is the Coordinator's Corner on BYU TV. Well, I'm just sad because I don't have the BYU TV channel at home, so I can't watch show offs. Well, that's crazy. You don't have to have the BYU TV channel to watch show offs. Yeah, no, I just stream it from BYUtv.org on my computer. Yeah. yeah, and I just have the BYU TV app downloaded on my phone, my tablet, my smart TV. Well, I can't afford all those things. Buddy, it's all free. Download the app for free. Not for free. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's go watch. Okay. Let's go watch all the episodes. <laughs> let's show off. Want to give that doodlebug a workout? Be serious, will you? Did you see this thing take off? One of your showboat tricks, Mr. Douglas. I tell you, I have nothing to do with it. Hey, we were turning. That rotten car is driving it. Hit me! No, he's done something to it. I've got to find out what? This baby happens to have an extra turn of speed. I'm your friend. to focus on the bad in the world but in the midst of it all are people doing all that they can to help make things brighter for starters watch kirby hayborn put his heart on the line in making good proving that you don't have to know everything to serve then on the fixers experts show how fixing a space can change the lives of those living in it prepare for all the fields with new shows and seasons all september on byu tv Coordinator's Corner is brought to you in part by JCW's The Burger Boys, Bailey's Moving and Storage, more than just a move, Siegfried and Jensen, serving Utah families for over 25 years. We continue on the Coordinator's Corner with Special Teams Coordinator Ed Lamb, who also functions as BYU's linebackers coach and assistant head coach. I mentioned earlier the place-kicking work of Jake Oldroyd. He was a two-for-two two on short field goals versus Utah. They weren't super short, but they were inside 40. He also punted well, uh, three boots for an average of 49. Uh, first punt, though, was returned uh, 40 yards by, by Britton Covey. And, and those kinds of returns, Ed, not very common uh, since you've been overseeing uh, the unit. Britton can make people miss. He's really good. What did you see when you broke it down besides uh, Diane Gomwaliku being tripped from behind and uh, a block in the yeah. back on Mitch Harris? <laughs> yeah, yeah thanks, thanks for bringing those up. I'll leave those out of it. We, I, I thought that we, on the perimeter, we didn't win. That was, that was the first thing. Um, Jake, I, I've made a deliberate decision to, to allow his punts to go a little bit further than, than what I normally require out of hang time. And I think we can do that. I think we have the guys to do that on the perimeter. And in this case, give Utah credit, we did not win on that punt in, at the perimeter. And so, so you know, Britain, credit Britain, he was able to find the ball, scoop it up off of the ground, and then get back going. And then, uh, you know, the coverage from there, there, were, uh, there, were, there was one uh, schematic breakdown in that. And what I mean by schematic is, you know, we, we, they all want to win and get down the field, but then they need to fit together in the shape of the coverage. And the shape broke down uh, early as well, and, and we didn't, just didn't respond well. Later in the game, you know, I thought the, the guys got better. We competed better, but I did not prepare them to win on the perimeter mm. in that first punt. Uh, for a special teams player of the week, uh, where did you go in the Utah game? Um, Diane Gonwaluku, and, and uh, you know, normally we would try to, to – select a different uh, special teams and defensive player of the game and, and try to spread the awards around a little bit. But uh, Dion was, uh, this is a, a really nice clip right here of him winning on the perimeter and then, uh, and then getting great field position for us. He played fantastic on defense as well. But the main things he, he gives to special teams is he refuses to come off of the special teams. And a lot of times when a guy reaches a certain level of, uh, 
I don't know, stardom or or uh, importance. How integral importance you are on defense. You, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. It, it, they sometimes they're the the way they see themselves on special teams is diminished, and they they want to talk about limiting their reps on special teams, and particularly the the, the tough uh, physical units like punt coverage and kickoff coverage. And um, he refuses. Basically, he he and I are going to get into a fight if I take him off of punt coverage and kickoff coverage. That is so important to him, and and that for several years now has transcended through the whole special teams units, especially the coverage guys. There's a certain level of pride, commitment, and I expect our, our punt coverage will come back really strong this game and, and throughout the season. Well, defensive coordinator Eli Satuiaki, not on today's show, uh, but you have some defensive oversight as well. You can talk to this. Coach E has Diane doing double duty. Uh, you guys have him as the defensive player of the week as well for his work against Utah. Yeah, he, he was fantastic in his uh, run support, his tackling, his coverage, and again, just, just what he brings. I mean, it's, it just, just his approach to the game affects everybody. He can be coached hard with a smile. He's hard on himself. Uh, but he's always out there just making the most of every single moment. And that's, we need that more than anything right now um, is, you know, all of us are, it's, it's part of our physical nature right now after a loss to be, to be down and have to rally ourselves. And he does that better than anybody. Uh, weird number. Uh, last year, BYU had two face mask penalties for the year. And they ended up with three against Utah on yeah. Thursday night. Yeah, and, and the, you know, there's as coaches, we we usually separate those into to uh, those that are you know that were completely unnecessary and ill-advised, and then those that are more of a tackling effort. And and I, I didn't think our our face mask in, in those situations were in any way a natural tackling effort. So we've got to do a better more innocuous job than with, egregious. Yeah, absolutely. now the one on the sideline is a tough one because of third and twenty-seven, obviously. It, it is, and yeah. it, but and yet it was unnatural uh, yeah. for our guy, and so we have to do a better job of training him. I mean, it, you know what the officials are usually looking for, and when there's a gray area, uh, um, of whether or not they should call something is 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 the football player doing a natural technique or a natural response to that situation, and so there's times to block, and there's times to tackle, and there's times to shed blocks, and and just you know, putting your hand on a face mask of the opponent in in a non-critical situation is just it, it, that's it's not a smart, not a, wasn't a smart move there. Let's see your linebackers for a little bit. Uh, outside backer Zane Anderson and inside backer Kavika Fonua shared the game lead in tackles. Isaiah and Jackson Kofusi and Keenan Peely were also high on the tackle list. Uh, linebackers account for both of BYU's PBUs and uh, had one and a half tackles for loss on the night. Yeah, I thought I thought it was a mixed bag at the linebacker spot from a group. Um, you know, we don't don't want to. Put too much emphasis into, um, you know, uh, whether the linebackers led the team in tackles. That's generally how the defense is designed and, and set up. And yeah. so that's, yeah. that sometimes it's just a product of doing your job, um, you know. And then I, I'd like to see our guys at, at the linebacker spot. We had a few times where we didn't respond well to run reads and we're playing a little soft in the pass game. And then we had too many missed tackles overall as, as a defense. And I thought our linebackers were right in there with that group. We need to improve in that area. Utah had only nine offensive possessions on the night. So that's a low number. Of course, the pick six is playing to that. Um, three of their drives lasted 11 plays or more, and BYU had no defensive uh, three and outs. And then the game ends with them holding the ball for 9-19 to end the game, uh, and that was the delay as well. Um, disappointing probably to not get the ball back, at least on offense, one time after the delay. Yeah, super disappointing. And, and I think a, a big part of that was, uh, was that we were demoralized and, and lacked belief in that moment. And... That really comes back to us as coaches. We've got to find a way to make sure our players understand that situation. Um, and we, we play for we play for the snap. We play to win the snap. And and even if winning the game is is unrealistic, um, you know, number one, we don't we don't know exactly what unrealistic is, and so we just got to keep playing. But you know, in that moment, we we should have looked to find players, whether they were on the bench or. I do a better job of motivating so that we can get the ball back for our offense and, and play the game out for just the worth of playing the game out. What were you told um, about the length of the delay, how, how long it might last, and was there a reset during the delay, and how did that all play out? Most, most uh, teams uh, you know, in this area of the country are pretty used to lightning delays, and, and so we were, we were aware right away that once lightning strikes within the vicinity uh, that the game is called, then we're looking at a minimum of a half hour, and, and so that was 
being communicated amongst the coaching staff right away. Our trainers were on it as they always are if, if we're in practice, et cetera. And then, uh, you know, Tom Homo was also notified by the officials and came into the coaches' boxes. And so I would say with, within five minutes, everybody knew that we were, we were going to prepare for about a half an hour at best. Ended up being closer to an hour at the end. What, what are typical activities during uh, a delay like that in the locker room in a game like that we had on Thursday? It's actually my first time in a game. It happens at practice all the time. Um, you know, in this in this part of the country and a lot of times we can just go into the indoor facility if that's not being used by physical education classes and things like that um, here but uh, in the game um, what initially we thought we would treat it like an extra halftime and so we met as coaches we talked about what we what we could do and, and usually we're talking about motivation personnel and then tactics and so we, we talked about that and then we broke back up into our uh, position groups and units and and discuss what we needed to do at the t at the point where we could go back out. It was a little difficult to be uh, down by that much in the score and not have a running clock. Typically on a halftime, the players can look up at any time and see, for example, there's six minutes and 30 seconds until we leave the locker room and start the next half. It, uh, it, it you know, that wasn't available to us, and I thought it was a challenge that we didn't uh, we, we didn't rise to the occasion and, and come out and play hard. All right, it is break time, and the fans. Your BYU Daily Cougar Sports play-by-play -play is Sports Nation. That's noon Eastern time on BYU TV. Coming up in our final segment, Coach Lamb looks ahead to Tennessee, and we go to social media for some questions from Cougar Nation. You're in the coordinator's corner. We are brought to you by JCW's, the Burger Boys. We're back with more with Coach Lamb right after this. Before I was a coach at BYU or before I was even a player, I was a BYU fan. That's why BYU football exists is because of the fans. To have a bunch of fans that want to see you be aggressive, I think everybody can live through our 123 guys on the roster and the 11 that are on the field at a time. Really, it all starts and ends with the fans. My name's Steve Batchel. Whoa! And this is Deadly 60 on a mission. My crew and I are traveling the planet in search of its deadliest creatures. It's not just animals that are deadly to me, but animals that are deadly in their own world. Only the most lethal will make my list. And you're coming with me! Every step of the way. Gear up for non-stop laughs and frivolity with all new episodes of your favorite comedy starting in September. Unbelievable. First, experience Eric LeClaire's mind-bending magic and family pranking on an all-new season of Tricked. So what do you say? You guys ready to have some fun? Then you could experience a one-time showing of an impromptu musical or a made-up Shakespearean sonnet. Who knows? Even the cast doesn't. What a bunch of fools! It's total improv comedy on show-offs. And when the Middle Ages meets Middle America, you're playing with fire and dragons and witches and, well, wait and see. Seriously? Watch White and Shining Armor. I've got this on lockup. Lockdown. And last but not least, enjoy your favorite sketch comedians in an all-new season with a brand new cast of Studio C. Oh, yes! Wow! Entertainment for all, starting this September on BYU TV. We are back on the Coordinator's Corner, brought to you by JCWs, visiting with BYU Special Teams Coordinator Ed Lamb, and Saturday in Knoxville, BYU versus Tennessee. First ever meeting between these two programs, uh, one of which will actually be 0-2 to start the year, which doesn't happen at either place very frequently. As tough as BYU's loss to Utah was, Tennessee arguably had it tougher, losing a season opener at home for the first time in 36 years, and losing to a non-P5 program for the first time in 11 years. The team picked to finish last in the Sun Belt, Georgia State, Beat the balls at Neyland and Coach Lamb um, pretty comfortably. Final margins eight points, but George State had that game in hand heading down the stretch. They did, yeah. It was, yeah, it was a game we watched live and then uh, also went back and watched the video. And, and Georgia State matched up really well. <coughs> Excuse me. They had they have some really good players at Georgia State. It's a strong team, and you know, it's just the the um, the thing we all can get in the habit of. Uh, of doing the bad habit of doing is taking a look at what a team did on a previous year and then and then trying to project what they are this year. Clearly, Georgia State's an improved team than they were a year ago, and and uh, and maybe caught Tennessee 
thinking that they were playing the 2018 uh, version of, of Georgia State. Whether previous year or previous week, you can never count on what happened previously to determine what's going to happen next, and you'd expect yeah. Tennessee to play. You'd expect them to be better. Yeah, that's well said. Yeah, we, we try not to get into the, the psyche of the opponent because we have no idea what's going on in their locker room. We have no idea, you know, what, uh, what kind of dynamics are at play between their coaches and, and players right now and, and within their team. And so we just we stay out of that and make sure that we're um, as prepared to play as we can be. It is, meantime, an interesting dynamic, though, and you can relate because both teams are stung, right? Uh, both teams are in bounce-back mode. Tough to say uh, who, quote-unquote, needs it more. Every week you need it. Um, the tougher task, maybe BYU's because you are uh, traveling. It's heat. It's humidity. Um, maybe a little more against you guys in that respect, but uh, both teams are like, we've got to get better. I think so. Yeah, that, that we can count on. That's a program with a proud history, as is BYU. We're... Uh, it's a history that many of us have personal pride in and have, have as part of our personal history, and it's a stewardship that we take very serious. And, and so this is, this is an opportunity, our first opportunity here for redemption over uh, coming off of a loss. Just a bit about um, how much was put into the Utah game, meaning it was an entire off-season of work, right? Uh, it's eight months. You could talk about Utah. You could say beat Utah and have it mean something, and then that game's gone. As much time went into it, as quickly as it has to be pushed aside, do you think that, that's been done with your guys? Huge challenge. Our, our guys started uh, started practice four minutes ago, and I'll and I'll join them here in, in a couple of minutes. They're mostly in their stretch periods right now, and we'll, we'll find out over the next couple of days. It'll be it'll be clear. It's uh, you know their attention in uh, meetings, their attention to detail out of practice, their level of, of energy and enthusiasm, and it's really it's really clear. I think any time a team is not bouncing back, and then. Uh, the strategies or, or motivational techniques to, to bring them back, I mean, that's, that's our challenge, and we'll, we'll have to just uh, find out what that challenge is minute by minute, day by day. Okay. Uh, did you guys meet as a team then this morning? or We, we have. We've, yeah. We had our post-game meetings on Friday and reviewed the, the previous game, and then today is all, all about moving forward. And, and the only time we maybe would allude to last week is, you know, we a special challenge to our punt uh, team this week to get off uh, blocks on the perimeter and, and cover like we I know that we can and we have and uh, and so that would just be one example of, of why we might allude to a previous performance a uh, bit more about Tennessee a new offensive coordinator in uh, Jim Cheney it's his second stint in Knoxville after some time at Georgia intervening his offense uh, not super sharp Saturday uh, like BYU they have three turnovers and and two of them cost them short field touchdowns it, it is a little bit of uh, early early season uh, uh, folly for them and and you know like like for us as well and and that can just happen uh, you know hopefully that uh, I think the challenge for coaches and teams moving forward is just to improve each week to the point where you know forcing the defense to make to make takeaways more than giving the ball away um, so uh, hopefully we'll improve on defense to the point where we can get some takeaways and I'm sure that you know Tennessee will improve much on offense talk with Coach Grimes about his previous experiences in Neyland. He's been a winner uh, with some SEC teams in the past going in there. Have you had any exposure to that neck of the woods? I, I've not. Never been to that stadium. I'm really excited about to getting in there and seeing it, the history of it, and competing against a great program. I mean, it's a, it's, it's one of the reasons that we all want to play and coach at the very highest level we can. And in a lot of ways, we're in a similar spot uh, that we were maybe after the Cal game last year. You've lost a home opener. Disappointing. You're going on the road to a tough team, historic venue, all that played together, and you guys come up with a big win that kind of helped steady the ship last year. I think so. And um, and then the then the challenge becomes, uh, you know, responding to the roller coaster of emotions. And I, I thought that we didn't. Uh, we didn't do that as well as we could last year, and, and hopefully the collective experience of our team this year would handle uh, a victory this, this weekend better. And, but uh, first thing is just preparing and going in and competing for that victory. Social media question from Twitter, Mitch Workman. Coaches often say that a game isn't defined by one play or even a few plays, but yet critical plays matter more because of context within a game. He asks, how do you balance that as a coaching staff so players feel the weight but not overburdened by the weight? Well, I, I, I'd say the, um, you know, in, in one sense, it's, it's easy because those critical plays, you don't know when they're, when they're going to occur. And so I think the players can really relate to the message of any play in a game could at any one. situation could be the critical one. And so we're, we, we look back and want to focus more on technique and details of our tactics and uh, sound fundamental football. And I, and I think maybe the question's alluding to now after the fact, how do we not go back and say, geez, if you just take away these three plays, we win, you know? Well, 
uh, I think our players are at this point in their career are, are smart enough for that. Um, and, and it's just kind of, we, we do, we remind them. And, but we want to make sure that we don't hear that type of talk. And defensively this, this week, we want to make sure that we're not, you know, uh, feeling like the defensive guys are really, you know, you hear this phrase sometimes, well, so-and-so played well enough to win or the yeah. offense played well enough to win. Uh, that kind of talk right there to anybody that's actually in a team sport, uh, you don't pay much attention to that. All right. We'll let you get out to practice. We'll see you soon. All right. Thanks, All right. Thank you, Coach. All right. That's going to do it for this week's edition of the Coordinator's Corner. Thanks to Coaches Grimes and Lamb. We're back with you next Monday, 1 Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific, right here in Studio C on BYU TV. So long. It's a 90-minute season premiere of Relative Race. What is going on right here? Four teams compete in the ultimate Stop, battle son. to find their families. <laughs> with stories so compelling. Did she ever want to find us? So meaningful. <laughs> you won't want to miss the tears, competition, <laughs> and surprising connections. I waited 32 years to see you. It all started with a princess. 